Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the interview. I have a very special friend with me today, a very special guest, somebody I've known for years, who've known me for years, before I was even in what I'm doing. I, of course, I like to introduce people, but I really love for them to introduce themselves. So if you don't mind telling people who you are, where you're from, and what you do. What's up, y'all? My name is Sarah Fontenot, and I am honored and excited to be here with you, Keith, because I have known you for years, and we have seen each other's growth journey, which is crazy. I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah. Uh, but to tell you a little bit about me, I'm just a woman that believes that we can be, do, and have anything that we want to be, do, and have, and I live it, and I expect it, and I go after it, and I will create it and build it and get in alignment with other people that are on that same tip. And I think that at the end of the day, they keep saying this thing like the only limit that you have is yourself. No, the only limit that we have is death because then there's no more options, right? At any given moment, you can change your mind. So I love helping people get out of their own way mentally mm. and emotionally first so they can then go on uh, to become whatever it is that they're excited about. And um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'm from Canada. <laughs> Yeah, I'm about to say, yeah, don't, yeah, you got to get it at that end, right? I'm from Canada, yes. And I have been uh, in America now for almost 16 years. I started in LA for my first 15. I moved to LA when I was 20 years old by myself. Yeah, yes, you did. And then I just most recently got to Atlanta, uh, August of last year, but wasn't really settled in until January of this year because I was doing so much traveling. Uh, but yeah, I, and now I, I just, I, I live my life. <laughs> Just so people are clear, you are, from what I understand, you are much of a life business coach uh, and an entrepreneur. Uh, you got your hands in many quite things, but also probably more publicly known as a public speaker, right? Yes. Speaker. So before we get into that, because that's what we, we that's that's what you're here to talk about. Uh, we want to know a little bit about your background. Now you say you're from Canada. Yeah. Now you're probably the first person I have that is not from well i have somebody from mexico but outside of that a black person that's not from here and we want to know what it's like growing up in canada versus los angeles oh my goodness well it depends on where in canada but i am from little house on the prairie so i am from regina saskatchewan canada oh man yeah, and i said it right that out I, I said it looks like <laughs> regina everybody's like that's regina no it's not it's yeah. called regina okay uh -huh. like, the, the slogan is the city that rhymes with fun okay Okay, well, well, there we go. It just gives you an idea <laughs> of <laughs> Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, yes, that's the province. Okay. And, um, you know, growing up, I was the only black girl in every grade. Mm. I was um, I was a rebel always. I've always been hard headed. And it's funny because now I'm very close. We're a very tight knit family. And I ask questions and we laugh all the time with my parents and my siblings. And I used to ask my more my mom and my dad. They tell this story about me where they said, you know, sir, we had to be really careful with you because there's a fine line between breaking your spirit and really empowering you to have those leadership abilities. And so for me, because I was very much like I challenge authority, I'm challenging what you're saying. Like, I don't just go with the flow. I'm like, no, nah, I got questions about this flow. Where's this flow going? Do I want to be there? Like, I have all of these different things. And so I'm so grateful that I had parents that understood and fostered that inside of me, that critical thinking Ness, that that idea to really be who it is that you want to be and not to let labels be put on to you because growing up in an all white city where I always felt like I never really fit in mm -hmm. me not fitting in was actually perfect because it was allowed if that made sense no that, it does make a lot of sense because most people have a different story right they grew up in an all black neighborhood and they got a different set of challenges but here you are saying hey I didn't had a whole different rule book to go by um and you grew up with both your parents in the house yeah right? yes beautiful, beautiful. I'm, glad, I'm happy to hear that i love those stories now right more yeah. than the others and uh you said how influential they were and me as a father i like to know i have two two, two girls how influ influential was your father in uh creating the mindset you have today or just being the person you are today oh my goodness both of my parents but my dad specifically so my dad is six foot eight 350 pounds, light skin, freckles, handsome, you know, and um, my mom is five foot one. I'm like, look at these little short littles getting all the tallies. It's, it's just, this is the way life goes. Right. Um, but anyway, my dad actually ruptured a disc in his back when I was 10 years old. And so mm. a lot of things shifted inside of our household. But what I will say is I have always known that I have a protector behind me. I have mm. always known, and it actually makes me think of a story 
growing up we, in, in my city, we have this thing called Mosaic. And Mosaic is three days in the summer where you get to go to different pavilions and learn about different cultures. So there, we, I was at the Caribbean pavilion. My mom taught Caribbean dance. Um, you know, there's a German pavilion, a French pavilion, an Italian pavilion. There's all of these different pavilions so that you can go learn about different cultures. You try their food and all of these different things. And so for us, you know, I was, a, I, I played steel drums my whole life. I was really, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I played double second and a tenor. And, um, and for a minute I played six bass, but that really wasn't my thing. I think my joint was like double second. Um, mm. but anyway, so it's funny because at steel, uh, inside of the mosaic, my dad always helped with security because he's six foot eight. He has no filter. I love this about him. He mm -hmm. has no tact. He's going to give it to you straight. <laughs> One thing about my dad, he is going to give it to you straight. And he's loud by nature, you know, mm -hmm. so he can come across as like kind of a scary man. Yeah. And I remember because he would help with security, there was another guy who was kind of big like him. But he was young. You know, he was probably in his 30s at this time. I'm in my probably, I don't know, eight or nine at mm -hmm. this time. And it was time for people to go. But the other big guy that used to help work the bar try to flex up because now there's women around and yeah, he uh -huh. wants to seem yeah, like, right, oh, I'm right. the man. Like, yeah. I'm, so my dad's like, yeah, y'all, y'all got to go. You ain't got to go home, but you got to get out of here. The other guy, he flees like, hey, man, we we this, that, and, and it's the, end, like the, the, the joint is closed. Like, go right. home, sir. <laughs> So my little eight and nine year old self, I'm walking with my dad. And this is just for me, such a such a like an epic depiction of how my dad was. And maybe to maybe that's why I'm a little bold even now, like my whole life I've been bold. That man started going off at my dad and immediately I'm I, I like jump. So not far in front of my dad. So for those of you that are watching, you can kind of see my hands. But for those of you that are listening, I jump like a foot. Like I assert myself into the conversation and I immediately start saying, you're disrespectful. You don't speak to your elders like this. And, and I'm, I'm literally like little girl going off on this other <laughs> huge man right. that knows that he he's in the wrong and that he needs to go. But I say that to say I always knew that my dad was there. Yeah. I always knew that my dad was my protector. Mm. And I also knew that my dad, my parents, they fostered fight. <laughs> they mm. they were like, yo, don't let anybody talk to you crazy. Don't let anybody talk about or disrespect your family. Now, we fought inside of our family. Wait, so just to understand the family, how many siblings did you have? I have seven, but five of us grew up in the same house. Wow. So, uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was a big family. Yeah, that is. It's a, it's and you family. are you the, the middle, you're I'm the last. I'm the second or... youngest, but the baby girl. So Ahmad, if you ever watch this, you ruined everything. Okay, <laughs> you ruined everything. Um, because now I'm the baby girl instead of yeah. the baby girl and the baby. Right. Yeah. Interesting. And and that being the baby girl, especially for your father, right? It's a whole different, different situation, ballroom. right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's interesting because uh, I ask people about their father relationship only because you know I'm I'm a father. And uh, that's kind of where my perspective is. So I'm learning here today, too. It ain't all about y'all that's listening. It's about me, too, y'all. <laughs> uh, I want to know some things. But um, interesting. Okay, so 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 you grow up in Canada now. Where, is your family from Canada prior to that, or did they, like, lo move there, and that's where they decided to grow a family? In? We ended up moving there. My mom is actually a 13th-generation Canadian. Okay. My dad is from Compton. Right on. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. so yeah. And, and my mom, huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you. And I'm the perfect combination of both. Yeah. <laughs> Compton and Canadian. Huh? Compton and it's Canadian. You know, yeah. your girl could be sweet yeah. or I could be a little sour, <laughs> but I'm here for it. No, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty interesting. So your mom, your, I'm sorry, your, your father moved to Compton. I mean, moved to Canada with, met your, mom. with your mom. No, they huh. met in California. Okay. They met in California a year, like how, however long ago. And uh, my mom wanted to get her master's in engineering. And I mean, obviously life is happening at the same time too, right. but she thought that Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada had one of the best op um, opportunities. And wow. so we all, we all ended up in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada through like life and journeys and all yeah. of the different things. And they were only supposed to be there for five years and uh -huh. it's been over 30. They're still there. They're still there. Yeah. So, so you, so you, you were born here, but then, okay. So, mm -hmm. so, okay. Oh, right. I didn't see that. Here it is. The story gets interesting. I was right. born in La Jolla, but I was raised in Regina. We moved there when I was three. And for people who are listening who don't know that is close to San Diego, am I correct? Yeah. Okay. Right on. Still, still Southern California. Yes. Okay, so uh, interesting. Right, here we go. 
All right, and I'm not going to ask the question. I know everybody's going to ask you every time you say you're from Canada, so I'm going to just let it slide. What I'm not, not going to ask the Drake question. I'm going to let it go. What's the Drake question? Do I know Drake? Yeah, I know. I know, right? I know. Drake is from Toronto. It's a four-hour <laughs> flight away from me, okay? Four-hour flight. I had to do it because people are thinking what I'm thinking, you know? Uh, and they, they want to know. So mm-hmm. uh, they think every black people, black person from Canada know each other, right? So, Mm-mm. okay, so you, uh, you come of age at 20 years old, and yeah. you decide, I'm leaving. What sparks this? idea that I'm moving to Los Angeles by myself. And what did your parents think about that? Oh, my parents were, my mom is uh, like a prayer warrior. So she was just like, I know my baby's going to be okay. I'm going to pray over her. My dad, look, I've been, I've been fighting my whole life. I just turned into a lady as I got older. So now I don't, I don't necessarily physically fight anymore, but they've always known, like they implemented in me that don't do anything that's out of integrity with self. And so I knew that they weren't concerned about me moving to Los Angeles because I had a very strong sense of self. Whether you love it or hate it, I have a very strong sense of self. And so he I don't think my parents were necessarily worried about me. My parents Mm -hmm. were kind of like, we believe in you. We love you. We support you. Um, And it's funny. The reason why I ended up moving to Los Angeles is because I thought that the only ways to be successful were doctor, lawyer, engineer, or entertainment. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what an entrepreneur was, to be completely honest. Like, I I had no idea. And I knew I couldn't be a doctor because blood makes me queasy. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, 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 God, it's terrible. Um, I didn't want to be an engineer because my mom's an engineer. And I saw what that took. And I was like, "Mm, I don't want any parts of that. And then I was like, I could be a lawyer because high key, I I love a good debate. You Mm -hmm. know, like, it's fun for me. Like, oh, this could be great. But then I counted the costs. And I wasn't interested in learning about things I wasn't interested in. Like, right. I'm not really interested in reading and, and memorizing the codes of all of the things when I'm mm-hmm. who even knows what I'm going to use. I just at the time that really wasn't an idea for me. And so then I was like, well, I love the sing, act and dance. Let's go. That's that's the thing. Like I was in a series back home. I've been dancing my whole life. I, I've done musical theater. You know, there were so many things that I was like, this is this is awesome. And um, it was kind of like a God wink because when I was probably almost 20, when I was 19, I went to visit my sister who was at the time living in Indianapolis and um, we were riding to the mall and on the radio, there was this casting call thing that you could go to at the mall. And I was like, I'm not going to go. I don't even live here. And my sister was like, no, you have to go. (laughs) We have to go. So it was like a modeling and an acting call. And I was like, okay. So I went to this modeling acting call and essentially I got a call back. And then that call back turned into a boot camp in Los Angeles. And then when I went to a boot camp in Los Angeles, he was like, I want you to audition to get into this school. And I auditioned to get into this school. They only take, I believe, somewhere between 15 to 20 people each semester. I got into the in in, and I was so excited. And so I had a plan kind of because I was like, I love singing, acting and dancing. Um, I was not prepared for the difference in so many different things. I mean, being the only black girl in Canada. And I I think it's something that's not really talked about enough. and, And being an ugly duckling, like no one ever thought I was pretty ever growing up like that was not I got zero attention growing up and then I started coming and then when I came to America and I got around other people like me I got I it was like almost overwhelming that people were so kind and people were would compliment so much and say oh my goodness you're so beautiful that it actually created this like wall of oh everybody's just trying to talk to the new Canadian girl or everybody's mm-hmm. just trying to and I, I literally was like I don't really I, I, I kind of kept everyone's at a at an arm's length. And then financially, I was struggling. You know, mm-hmm. I always share. I was the girl calling my mom every month saying, can you please help me pay my rent? I was a girl digging in the couch trying to find change so I could put three dollars on pump five. You know, so there's so many, so many really cool, intricate portions to my story that built me into the, this 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 person that's here today. And I'm really grateful for it. You know, that's a that's a relatable story to a degree. I spent a little bit of time in the Inland Empire before all the black people moved out there. I was I was, I was part of the first black flight with right. like my mom, right? <laughs> and at the time it was full of white people. And then when I stayed there for a couple of years and moved back to Inglewood, I got way more attention that I wasn't getting out there. And I'm like, maybe am I just a new kid? Everybody feeling me all of a sudden? Yeah. Like, man, I've been getting no attention for all this time. So I definitely can see that, right? You're you're not sure if you are pretty or if everybody's just 
trying to take advantage of you because you knew, right? Right. And they want something quote unquote exotic. Yep. Right. So you're fit. You're being fetishized more than you are being desired. Yes. Because it's like, do you want me or do you want the prototype? Yeah. You know, because yeah. I'm very real and, and I, I feel like actually realistically speaking, I feel like inside of dating a lot, it's it's a lot of people that have no idea what they actually want. Mm-hmm. It's just a, a search for a prototype that they can fit any person into, which is a whole other conversation. But I mean, yeah. I, I and so, you know, here we are now. We're mm-hmm. we're moved to Los Angeles. I, I got into this school. I'm kind of settled now. Right. I don't really got my, my financial stuff together so Ooh. and you're 20 at this point correct yes i so, was 20 years old and i think that's around the time we end up being introduced to one another right yep, so exactly. i was in college we all struggling right we all <laughs> broken eating noodles so maybe that's what bonded <laughs> us uh but uh however so you have to navigate now to this new space you have no family out here right at the time you got to make new friends mm-hmm. and, and all this stuff so what do you do now like i'm here i'm broke what are my <laughs> next steps Cause obviously now you're not, are you still trying to, are you still acting? Are you still? Uh, I do skits um, with a guy named country Wayne. I know and country, so, yeah. 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 So I do do skits with him, but I, I wasn't going to, I, I, I love the art of acting, but I really found that I didn't like the industry. Mm-hmm. And so inside of that, it was like, mm, no. So I, I am really blessed and grateful that now I still get to act. And it's just like Wayne has like his own world. So mm-hmm. it's like Wayne's world, which is outside of. But what I believe is it goes toe to toe with with the entertainment industry. So that was really a blessing. But outside of that, no, I don't act anymore. OK, so how and when did you make the transition? And when did you decide, like, I'm done with this, I'm going to go in a new direction? Because that has to be. A moment in time, I can imagine probably going through a little bit of depression at that moment, right? Uh, identity crisis. Who identity am I now? Crisis. <laughs> because now I'm now I'm not this. So what am I? Right? Yes. Oh my goodness. So I actually okay. So it's I feel like we we as people have to pay attention to the God winks that we get inside of our lives, and if we surrender to them instead of fight them, the blessing often comes much faster. And so what I mean by that is when I was acting and I was in my theater academy and I, you know, I was in, I'm in this conservatory and I'm learning all the things and parts of acting, directing, um, how to make movies, all of these different things. And while I'm in it, I slip and fall into network marketing. While I'm inside of network marketing, I met a girl because, and I met her because I actually slipped and fell into the Miss California pageant, which was hilarious in itself. Mm-hmm. But I saw a girl and the first time I saw her, we both needed to lose weight. But when I saw her six weeks later, she looked like a Barbie doll. And I was like, first of all, OK, surgery does not heal this fast. And I don't see any bruising. Like what like what drugs are you right. taking? I need some of them. I need the drugs. <laughs> she was literally like, no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm Come work out with me. I was like, I don't want your workout. I want your drug. <laughs> she was like, she was like, no. So she became my friend, and we still chit chat to this day. This is literally she. Cha- this woman changed my life. I went to a workout, and it's seven o'clock in the morning, and there's like people like, woo, like just cheering, going crazy at Santa Monica Beach at the crack of dawn for me at that time because you know I was not, an, I'm still not an early riser, but I definitely wasn't an early riser then. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so it's funny because I was like, oh my goodness, these are my people. Like, where, where have I been and where have y'all been in my life? And so I was so excited that I, I was like, I want to sign up, but I didn't have the money. And it was $68, by the way, Mm. I didn't have $68 to sign up with the company. And so I called my boyfriend at the time and I was like, sir, I know I don't really like asking for anything. But I need $68. <laughs> he was like, what are you talking about? I was like, I really need $68. I want to start this thing. And I and I ended up doing really well in the thing. You know, I built to the top 1% of the company. And I changed a lot of lives and helped people grow businesses. And, and it, it really shifted things. But I realized, I think the thing for me that made it where I didn't necessarily have an identity crisis after acting, although I did after network marketing, mm. um, after acting was I was asking myself, why am I even doing this? And I realized that I wanted to be an actress because I wanted um, an elevated platform where I could reach out to inspire and encourage more people. And then when I started getting around network marketers, one of the things that we learn 
is to work harder on yourself than you do in anything else. And any and anything else is possible, the right? Good old Jim Rohn. Work good on old yourself, Jim then Rohn. Your job. Uncle yeah. Jimmy. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so so inside of that, I I realized that not only do I want an elevated platform to be able to encourage, inspire, and uplift and motivate people, but I also wanted to be able to provide access. How can you do this too? And in acting, I can't give a role away. You know, mm. I, I I can't put you on, right? But I can put you on if you're willing to follow a blueprint. Yeah. And so for me, that that was really that was really life changing for me. No, I can imagine, and I spent a lot of time in network marketing as well. Mm-hmm. As you know, and totally changed my life. And I wouldn't be an entrepreneur today if it wasn't for that experience, Period. right? Yeah. Now you mentioned something. Which now I got now we got to skip to you talk about that identity crisis. Oh my god! And the reason why I have to ask that because let me tell you, that was the second time in my life I was ever depressed, mm-hmm. and it was the first time as an adult I was depressed going through that transition. What do I do now? So talk to me about that moment, right? You're like, okay, network marketing. It's it's I'm 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 at the end here. Yeah. And I know the mentality, right? I'm doing I'm all in. Yeah. And when you go all in, all and then in. you have to step all out what does that mean how did you deal with that oh man i've never been married but i felt like I, this is what divorce has to feel like wow. and mm. what i mean by that is i spent up until that point all of my adulthood pouring blood sweat yeah. tears sweat equity like my team i poured everything that i had into this thing yeah. and so to walk away felt like i felt like a failure I felt mm. like I, 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 I left people out to dry. Right. I felt like, like no one could really count on me. Mm. I felt like, should I, should I just stick to it? Like, should, maybe I don't need to walk away. Maybe I could just follow the rules that they want me to follow. And, and I can, I can fit into their box. And it's crazy because it actually took me probably two and a half, maybe three years to transition out all the way. Because right. I kept riding the fence of yeah. like, do I really have to go? No, I have to go. And and I, I felt like I heard God. I heard God saying, bigger, Sarah, bigger, like not better, just bigger. Like you're, you're, you're here for something bigger. You're he- it's mm-hmm. not about that. Like who have I called you to be? This is what God, the conversation I'm having with God, who have I called you to be? Cause this isn't it. And so now I'm fighting with God and I'm fighting with the company because the company doesn't want me to do things the way that I'm doing things. And, and God, you know, God, God, God be doing what God does. Right. And, and I feel like, you know, if you don't learn the lesson, I personally have experienced in my relationship with God, the more that I try to ignore the lesson, the more that I try to pretend like I'm, I'm, I'm what he's saying is null and void. The more that I try to act like my plan is better than his plan is the more drastic he has to pull me away from what I'm doing. And I say that to say, you know, I I was in a relationship right before I moved to LA and I was engaged. That was the first time I was engaged. I've been engaged twice for, yeah. Yep. Third time's a charm, by the way. <laughs> and, um, you know, when I was 19 years old and I'll, I'll never forget because I knew that this person, I was not supposed to be with this person. I knew it. And God kept saying different, Sarah, different, different, Sarah, different. And I didn't listen. Long story short, I was almost paralyzed by this man. I got beat up so bad. And sometimes, and I'm grateful because, you know, if I had moved in an eighth of an inch in the opposite direction, I'd be paralyzed from my hips down. Wow. And so it's wild because it's the smallest units of measure that make the biggest differences. It's it's and I'm not a victim. OK, I'm like I'm a victor. I'm walking. I'm grateful. I know that that's hard for people to hear. But sometimes we have to understand that if we continue to do the wrong things, we can't get upset when wrong things keep happening to mm-hmm. us. Right. So um I'm grateful for that, but I, I just, I knew that I needed to do something different. And so when I finally created the identity and also inside of identity, other people know you as that too. Right. Right. So now it took me years to overcome the identity that other people, even now, every so often people will be like, Oh my God, I loved you inside of the company. Oh my God. I Mm -hmm. looked up to you so much inside of the company. And it's like, Oh, I'm so honored by that. But it took years for people to stop making that like I was that thing yeah and we have to be able to separate what we do from who we are yeah you know and and uh I'm trying to I'm trying to express this because I know exactly what you're talking about right because I I was 
I was, I've been on the other side as well, and I know you. So, but for people who don't, who may not know, um, when you are involved in network marketing, you're responsible for leading a team of people. Yes. And I must say, where um, even where I was, where Sarah was in her company, it's hundreds of people that she's responsible for, not just here, but all over the country. The takes, world, right? The world, right? Take yes. especially come you're in, right? So it takes a lot of traveling, a lot of money, a lot of investing time, energy, phone calls, effort into people. And you kind of lose yourself in a sense because you're worried about everybody else, right? That's what it's about. Yeah. So I can imagine, right? Now you got to refine yourself. Yeah. And you said, okay, I'm going to reestablish myself as an entrepreneur, as a speaker, which is almost like what she was already doing, mm -hmm. <laughs> essentially. So how did you, I guess, title yourself now after you were saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm I'm done with network marketing. I have to retitle myself. Mm -hmm. What did you retitle yourself as? I retitled myself as a serial entrepreneur and a speaker, but I started the businesses first. So even inside of like that two and a half, three year gap, this is when I started doing coaching on the side. This is when I started a mindset motivation t-shirt line. This is when I was speaking outside of just the things that I was doing with my network marketing company. So I've always kind of overlapped. It was never like a cut and dry of anything. Um, but I, I, I started working my way into things. But I will say that a lot of the times people, for those of you that are listening and you may be like, well, what am I supposed to do? Maybe you're in that place of like, what is next for me? Well, what if people noticed or said that you've done, right? So when you start thinking about, um, you know, what are you good at? I'm sure that other people have told you before. Right. And so for me, people used to ask me all the time. They used to say like, Sarah, how are you so strong? How are you so strong? And I was like, I'm, I'm not that strong. Actually, at that time, I'm crying myself to sleep at night. I feel like I don't I don't I don't belong anywhere. I feel like I'm doing all the wrong things. I don't feel like I'm an in purpose on purpose. But y'all see me showing up and I'm like, OK, so then I started to reflect and ask myself, well, how do I keep going? What are the things and the methods and the tangible tools that I do? What is the inner self-talk that I'm having with myself? And when I got crystal clear on exactly what I was doing, and I mean exactly what I was doing, down to my morning regimen, mm -hmm. down to the way that I talk to myself, down to um, you know the, 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 the way that I shift how I look at things, down to my perspective, all of these different things, when it started, when I got crystal clear on that, then I could teach it. And one thing that I know about entrepreneurs in, in life general, in general, is they're really good at hustling, but they don't know how to teach it. You know, they, they, they can't, they can't even, even inside of network marketing. One of the reasons why I was successful in network marketing is because I coined a thing called strive for five. Everyone in network marketing is looking for the need of platinum needle in a haystack, platinum mm -hmm. needle. in a, well, let me teach you how to cultivate the haystack. Right. I would rather have many that do few than few that does, you know, then, then your business is wonky and you don't really know what's yes, going to happen. Yes, you can't exactly really depend. Right. So for me in business, business is business regardless. Yeah. So I feel like I got a, re a lot of really great grooming, de like details, a lot of really, it was a great grooming ground for me inside of network marketing. Because it, was it was education. It was, it was the best education, right? I, I, say all the time, I say all the time, it's the, uh, it's the, uh, it's the college for entrepreneurs. Network yes. marketing is a college for entrepreneurs. Yeah. That's why I really felt it, it, it was for me. And uh, it sounds like it's the same for you. It taught you everything. It gave you all the tools and the practice Yes. under somebody else's name and company, right? Yes. Before you start your own. Yes. So let's jump into that. Uh, you now, right? As a professional speaker, you're traveling all over the place. Yeah. How does it feel to get to where you are now? Do you ever see like, you ever think like, man, I never thought I would be here. Or now you have all these people that are looking at you and they are following you and they're kind of leaning on your every word, kind of the same stuff you're going through the network marketing. Why, why does it feel different now? Um, I think that I never really try to use the barometer of what other people think, because if I do that, I get lost in the sauce. And often I would come from a space of ego instead of being, you know, just armor off and just being. And I, I, I get emotional. I hope I don't cry. If I do, I'm sorry. It's all good. Um, but what makes me feel good is I remember when I was 10 years old and, um, you know, I, I've, I've always been a rebel. I said it earlier. And I think back to the time when I was 10 years old and I woke up to go to the washroom. That's a bathroom. I'm Canadian. So I woke up to go to the washroom, but I hear something in the kitchen. And so I 
I, we, we grew up hearing, if you ever hear something, don't go look. Right. So I'm like, I need to find out what is this thing. And so I wake up and I so quietly, I, I go to my door and I peek around the corner and this is outside of my room. There's a hallway and there's nothing down the hallway. So I slink down the hallway being as quiet as I can. And when you get to the end of the hallway, it's either the living room on one side or the kitchen on the other. But most of the kitchen is blocked because of the first part that you see in the kitchen is the fridge. So you can peek around the fridge and see the dining room table, right? And so as I'm walking down the hallway and then I slink around the fridge and as I'm sitting there, I'm not sitting there. I'm, I'm, I'm looking dead at my mom in the middle of the night. It's probably two o'clock in the morning. And my mom is sobbing over her homework at two o'clock in the morning by herself. I mean, just literally like sobbing by herself in the middle of the night. Sorry. And I so quietly tried to get back to my bedroom (laughs) And I didn't want her to know that I saw her, you know, because in that moment I had never seen my mom as quote unquote weak before. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, I know now that that's actually one of the most beautiful times that I ever, the most strong that I've ever seen my mom, because in a few hours she would have to have all of us kids up Mm -hmm. to go to school. She had a full-time job. Um, She was studying to get her master's in engineering. My dad had just had his injury. She had her own life. And still she showed up in the morning with poise. She showed up in the morning with grace. She showed up in the morning with like a positive attitude, you know, and I, I never doubted if either of my parents loved me. I never doubted if either of my parents would be there for me. Right. And so I say that to say that when I look at my success, I think about my mom that doesn't have to sit at a table and cry over anything much anymore. You know, outside of the challenges that God puts up, you know, when I think about my success, I think about how we're on right now, currently on our second battle with my dad's cancer. Mm -hmm. And I think about how in in, an instant, I'm able to book a flight to go home to be with my parents. In an instant, I'm able to fly them out to be a part of whatever it is that I have going on. In an instant, I get to choose the life that I'm living. And so for me, because I'm also very clear now that what's most important to me is loving connection. Um, relationships is what's most important to me. Like, and I've, I've done all the things. First of all, you have to make the money to know that yes. <laughs> because when you're broke and you can't, you can't do That's much. That's real right there. Right. You, you gotta, can't get, right. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta figure that out first. You really do. You gotta figure that out first. But after I figured it out, after you get the money, you oh realize, my goodness, yeah. it's like it doesn't mean anything. And it's funny because I think back to the second time that I was engaged, and it was like on Instagram, you know, we were every hashtag, we were black love, we were power couple, we were relationship goals. But in reality, it was so toxic. And some of us are so invested into the perception that we're not actually being aware of the reality, or we know that it's actually really toxic, but the perception is more important, which means some of us right now are surrendering our destinies, loving and listening to the wrong people. And it's just not worth it. I remember my ex said to me, he looked my looked me dead in the face. This is when I was at the top 3% in network marketing and everything was a competition. And he said, Sarah, you'll never make it. The only way you'd make it is if you married someone who made it. Mm. And I'm like, first of all, sir, what, what, what? <laughs> I'm confused because this is the same man that told me that he forwarded his success in business by 10 years just by being with me. Mm. So I'm confused, you know, and there was a lot of things. It wasn't the distrust that made me leave that relationship. It wasn't the betrayal that made me leave that relationship. It was straight up you not seeing clearly on the vision that we've been talking about. If that's how you really feel, you need to be with somebody else. And 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 not to, you know, backtrack because I do want to talk about that, right? Yeah. Uh, I, that's something that we have to get into before we leave. But mm-hmm. I want to um, revert back to you know, you as a professional, because I think that it's important to recognize, like you, you, you said something that you got to make the money first yeah, before you realize what it is, right? Everybody wants to be happy, but you, being broke ain't being happy. I don't no. care what nobody <laughs> say. It ain't all about the money until you, if you broke it, it is in. about the money. Right. <laughs> um, so what was that like? Like, 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 what was your first like big check when you was like, hold on, I got something here, right? Like, what was that? What was that moment like or what 
gig was that? If you can share, if you can be that open about it. Man, honestly, for me, it's always been in the small beginnings. It's always been in the small beginnings because honestly, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, it all becomes the same after a while. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's that now it's, 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 it's all the same. But when you realize that you have something that works to get to the money, that's when I was like, oh, you can't tell me nothing, right? When people try to tell you, oh, your little business, that's never going to work for you. Oh, you acting funny now. Oh, but now I have proof. Yeah. I got proof now. After a while, you know, the the the, the money's great, but it, it's literally just like, ah, it's how many watches can I wear at once? OK, how many <laughs> pairs of shoes can I yeah. wear at once? How many bags can I wear at once? Like right. it, it's not it's just not it's not what validates me anymore. But I had mm. to realize that the perception didn't I mean, perception is important, but it's not the most important. Reality is so much more important than that. So because at the end of the day, I would give away every bag, every shoe, every watch, every piece of jewelry, every everything to know that my dad's cancer is gone. Right. Period. Absolutely. Without a without a question, mm -hmm. you know, and and then also I know me enough to know that if all those things are gone, I will get them back because I have the tool and the skill set mm -hmm. to do so. Right. And I think that so many people want things for free, like get up and do some work. Even right now, I'm, 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 I have a very intimate event that I'm doing in September and I'm really excited about it. It's a high ticket event. And it's so funny because I, I even me, I was having a conversation with one of my girlfriends, ultra successful woman, pretty much is employed most of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she's the who's who of Atlanta for sure. And we were having conversations that I'd been talking about how I'm going to do this event, how I'm going to do this event. And these last seven months of my life has been just transparently speaking, the most challenging that I've ever had in the existence of my life, like ever. This is the hardest seven months of, of my life where I really needed to develop new tools, right? See, here, and here you go. Now, you, you, I'm glad you're going this way because you're leading to my next question. So go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So inside of that, my, my girl, I'm talking about this event. I'm talking about this event. And she's like, Sarah, pick a date. Stop talking to me about this event if you aren't going to do it. And I'm like, oh, first of all, don't nobody talk to me like that. Right. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> and also, you're right. Now yeah. I got a date. I got my lineup of speakers. I have, I, we just, oh, there's so many blessings that are coming from it. And I'm just really, really, really excited about it. Um, as, as an entrepreneur, yeah, there's plenty of times. And I ask almost every entrepreneur that sits in front of me the same question. Mm -hmm. And it's about one to stop or give up or... <sighs> Like I'm, I gotta do something. I just can't take it or whatever. I'm just out the door. When was the last time you felt that? And mm. well, why did you feel that in that moment? Mm. I I think for me it wasn't it wasn't in business. I think for me, over the last seven months of my life, I got really, really, really clear on. And I've, I've always been a family person, but I got really clear on what's most important to me. And so I was willing, ready, able to give up. Do I need to move back to Canada? Like, what do I need to do? Do I, do I need to be a, 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 a caregiver? Like, and do I, cause even now, like I, I got a chef for my parents so that my mom doesn't have to cook every single meal so that they can eat more healthy, all of these different things. Life um, flex, life flex real quick. You know, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just saying like, yeah. what do, what do I need to do? I'm again, I can't be a doctor. I can't be a nurse. I get queasy, but I could hire one, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like when when there were no options and everything was just like waiting it was like god and then on top of that there were business challenges there were relationship challenges there was all of these different things i felt like i was being pulled in every direction mentally emotionally spiritually physically financially and energetically in these last 7 months and so inside of that i've been it's been like a like like okay so let me say this i do a thing every morning called morning vision at least as every morning as I possibly can. And morning vision is um, is where I, I journal and then I manifest by getting into a feeling state because we don't attract what we think about. We attract what we feel strongest about. And some of us are too strongly feeling about our lack, our exhaustion, how this person makes you mad, the gossip that's happening in your life. And that's why we perpetuate the same negative toxic life over and over and over again, right? So for me, I... I I write down, I'm so blessed, happy, and grateful now that X, Y, Z, like whatever the that is. 
And I found myself physically feeling, if you could imagine, like there was white noise in my chest, like nothing was going in and nothing was coming out. There was a blockage between Mm. what I knew in my core and where my head was at. Like I I couldn't connect the two. Mm. And sometimes some of us keep trying to overlay the like positivity on top of what clearly is not positive. Right. right? right. And, and, and suppression turns to depression if you don't pay attention. And so I knew that I, I needed to release how I was feeling. I knew that me saying I'm so blessed, happy and grateful. Now that was not the answer. I needed to hit a couple fetal positions all over again and Mm. cry. Mm -hmm. You know, I needed to, to, to be angry. I needed to have conversations with God that were not like, well, God, I know you No, God, I, this is my expectation. I'm expecting you like mm-hmm. I am the expectant. And I know that we have control over nothing, but at the end of the day, we have to be willing to identify when we're not okay. We have to be willing to identify when you have to hit a fetal position. And I think that sometimes there's this, there's this you know, leaders and successful people have to be perfect. Perfection does not exist. Leadership does not mean perfection, you know, and, and to allow us to really feel and be and, and cry and be upset and pull back and, and be disengaged. And so for me on a different level, I was really ready to just be like, like what, like, what is, what, what is this? Like, Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't even know how to deal with the feelings that I'm having right now. Cause I've never had them. And not only that, you are responsible for motivating a lot of people. Oh my gosh. So how do you motivate somebody when you're not motivated or when you got something else, right? You got to, you may have a client at this moment that, that needs coaching on whatever it is, right? Their business structure. And then you find out your dad got cancer. It's not going to be a good session, but you still got to show up, smile and pour into them. Right. Yeah. How you deal with that moment? Like, right. With a moment where you have to pour into everybody else, but like, or who pours into you? Let me ask you that. Like, where do you get your motivation from? Yeah. So I have a tribe of very close people and um, I know that I was heavy and I, and I kind of gave the disclaimer, but sometimes, you know, we're all human and we all have our expectation and we all have our normalcies with people. Right. And so if you know that I'm usually the person that is positive and I have great energy and I have all the great vibes. And now all of a sudden I'm a little more melatonin. I'm a little more um, like, mm -hmm, like I'm listening, but I'm not like I'm hearing you, but I'm not really listening the same. Or when these things start to happen, you actually start to see who's in your life for you and who's in your life for what you can bring. And so I'm really grateful that I have such a strong group of people that held for me in that moment. One of my girlfriends was literally like, Sarah, you need a rage session. I was like, this sounds very white. Sorry, but (laughs) it does. What does this even mean? I've never heard of a rage session in my life. And, um, you know, she broke it down. She's like, well, you, whether you scream, whether you punch a pillow, whether you throw some stuff, she's like, I would love to facilitate that for you. You know, and so shout out to my girl, Celeste, like my girl, like my girls are literally like, if you need to cry, cry. One of my other girlfriends, um, Lee, shout out to you. Um, we were doing morning vision together. And this is when I identified, like, I, I, I was like, I can't even say I'm so blessed, happy and grateful now that I keep thinking the negative. And so Lee put her book down and she says to me, she says, Sarah, what is light? And I was like, what? She's like, what is light? And not in color, but in weight. What is Mm. light? And I was like, um... Well, I have a roof over my head. My bills are paid. My And then I found myself again. One thing led to the next. And I'm right back to the negative. And she said, Sarah, what is light? So I'd have to bring it back. Okay, what is light? I'm here. You know what? I woke up this morning. You know what? There, there, There is food in my fridge. There's, 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 and I started thinking of all these things and then I found myself again. And so it goes back to actually what I teach that in order to be successful in anything, happy in anything, purposeful in anything, you have to condition it because negativity is natural. You have to be positive on purpose. And so Mm -hmm. when you find that human piece of you that keeps drawing back, that keeps drawing to the negative, that keeps drawing to you're never going to make it, you have to be willing to do the work to focus on what is light, what is good, what, what gets you inspired. Yeah. 
And so having these different people in my life and there's, there's literally, I have a group of eight, right? There's a group of eight people that hold me accountable, but also allow me to be human. So when I do have to have those down times, which I've, I had, like, it was very clearly right. Sarah is out of commission right now. Right, right. You know? I this, could, right. this is out. And and even with like, even I, I, I wasn't posting on social media the same. I wasn't mm-hmm. going live the same. I wasn't coaching the same. Right. I had to take a break from people because another thing that I personally am not going to do is I'm not going to fake it. So you're going to get what you get when you get it. And if in that moment, it means this is monotone, Sarah. This is Sarah that you can see a little bit of sadness in my eyes, Mm -hmm. Sarah, that you can see that I'm fighting to show up. I'll go to my obligations, but outside of that, I'm not doing much extra, you know, and, and I, and that felt like I even then felt like I'm letting people down and then, you know, so you have to, are they they getting what they pay for now? Yeah, now it's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be this. And so, so then you have, again, you have to condition it. There's a level of conditioning that happens inside of anything. Yeah, um, and I would agree. You got to condition your mind. I got a good friend. His name is Marcus Cargill. I had him on the show as well. He's a peace coach, one of the most poised, peaceful individuals. And when you see him, like he's a real big, strong, big guy, right? Dreads, talks very slow, talks mm. very low, mm. very peaceful. Uh, he dresses to the nines. I mean, he's just a walking. I saw. I was like, bro, you you like a gazelle. You just like. <laughs> Just wanna just, I, yeah, you're just graceful, bro. Just looking at you, just walk. Whatever you do, just feels good, you know. Yeah. Um. He doesn't send text messages. He always sends videos. Like uh, instead, it's just you just it's like God, you're like, just a thing dope for real. You're just a thing, right? So, um, and he says some of the same things that that, that that you're saying, and I see him as one of the most peaceful individuals. As we transition a little bit into you know your experience from a personal level, and I'm bringing this up because you brought it up, and I'm talking about you've been engaged a few times, a couple times. So I want to say a few, twice. a couple times, right? Twice. Third time's a charm, right? And people may see you in all these areas of success, right? Yeah. And you think that people ever like hold that against you or try to like point that out because it's like here you are, successful business person, yeah. But now you have a personal life that maybe some deem successful, maybe some deem not, right? Yeah. Either way, I remember asking you a question. You probably don't even remember this. I asked you a question years ago, and I never forgot this. I swear <laughs> to you. I said, what makes you think that you would be a good uh, uh, good person in relationship, right? Uh-huh. And I remember you sit there. You said, because I'm slow to anger. Mm. And I don't, you probably don't even remember saying that. But I remember it distinctively because I've never heard, any, well, especially a woman say that, right? Because we have this conception. So I'm going to ask you now. You know, now that you've been engaged twice, whether it was your reason, it was your fault or not, not your fault. What do you think makes you a good companion? Ooh, I love this question. I think that what makes me a good companion is that. So I'm in a new space in my life, right? Because I feel like in the past I've been very rigid. And what I mean by that is I have been quick to say, oh, you don't fit the standard that I need. I'm done. Right. And I'll tell you a few times, like, you know, I'll tell you two or three times, three or four times. But after so many times, I'm like, OK, you're there. If there's no effort or there's no change, then it's like this probably just isn't in alignment for me. I'm also very clear that my dating pool is very small. And so that also plays a, a big part of things. Okay, well, but how small? How small are we talking? Like, what is, what is, is there like a list of requirements or is there some I guess what's a non-negotiable? Yeah, she did. <laughs> um, there are several. Um, it, a non-negotiable is so now. What's important to me is safety, security, respect, emotional intelligence, emotional regulation, and effective communication. So what do I mean by that? I mean that even inside of like people are, it's like buzzwords right now, right? Like emotional intelligence. I'm emotionally intelligent. Okay, well, are you? Can you emotionally regulate? Can you actually do with the information in a way where you're not just reactive? Because you might be emotionally intelligent enough to identify that this person may need compassion. This person may need reassurance. This person may need, you know, love or a hug or attention or whatever it could possibly be. But are you can you emotionally regulate yourself if you're upset enough to say, let me get in alignment with that? Can you love that person the way they need to be loved and are willing to actually try? Or are you more committed to what you want inside of a relationship? And so for me, I feel like 
that lowers the 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 level of of man, right? Like mm-hmm. I and I know that, and I'm okay with that. So um, because I like my own, I have I have a very full purposeful life and I'm dating. Don't get me Mm -hmm. wrong. I'm having an amazing time and I'm very happy. However, I'm, I'm also very clear on if the vision is not in alignment, then I would rather not. I would, I like me and I like my family and I love my friends and I love how we travel and I, how Mm -hmm. I love what I do. And, and, and so you actually have to bring value in order to be the like my person. It's not going to be, Oh, I'm lonely. Like I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not looking for, you know, a time, a filler. I don't need filler. So, okay. So let me ask this question directly, m- more directly than a uh, okay, di- new on. question. So where do you feel like you uh, should improve based on your last two engagements? What was something you feel like, this is what I, I should have did differently, or this is what I could have proved on to be a better companion in a relationship? Um, I think both of those times I shouldn't have been with those men first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like in, and what I mean by that is our visions were not the same. Even, even, even the the second person that I was engaged to, um, to give you an, an idea, I remember we were in Best Buy looking at, we were just in Best Buy and we went to the TV section. You know, the Best Buys with like the $10,000 yeah, uh-huh. TVs, 7000 mm-hmm. In the back, right. Yeah, in the back. And we're just looking at TVs. I will never, I don't care how successful I am, me personally, Sarah, no, will never spend ten thousand dollars on a TV. I because I don't deem that as valuable to me. Mm-hmm. But there are people out there that deem that as valuable, right. and that's great for them. Depending on how much money you make, you might you might, you might drop a little ten piece on TV. There ain't no way. <laughs> I, I'm telling you right now, I do not. But I don't. I don't even watch TV. Right? I feel like, that. I, I, that's what was next. I figured that it, yeah. was, it was just not going to yeah. happen for me. Now, would I drop ten thousand dollars on something that someone may deem as invaluable? Absolutely. But the TV ain't it. The TV is not it. Okay. No. Um, so I say that to say that when we went to the store, the girl, the girl that works there came up to us and she's like, hey, you know, do you guys need any help? Or are you just looking around? And we're like, oh, we're just looking around. She's like, yeah, because no one's going to buy this $7,000 TV. Anyway, she's being funny. I got the humor. And I was like, girl, I'm with <laughs> you. But my ex at the time was so triggered mm. by the fact that in his mind he heard her say you can't afford, afford this yeah. TV. I can imagine that yeah the ego the ego was attacked right? oh uh, he was so triggered and the worst part is I need six of them now no right, no right, he, okay. <laughs> he, he said he said um what kind of what kind of car do you drive and she said a Prius and he was like oh well some people have Prius mindsets and or no Prius tastes and other people have Maserati tastes. And he pulled out the Maserati key. And I literally, Keith, was so mortified. Like, it, it, like if, right. if, I, if I could have melted onto the ground and disappeared, I much rather would have that. I was, I have never, don't ever speak to a person like that. Right, like, right. and she was, she wasn't even trying to attack your character, right. you know? So in that sense, I feel like, my biggest red flag inside of relationships is not taking the time to vet who it is that I'm talking to. Like so many of my relationships never would have actually happened if I took the time to vet them out first. Okay. Well, hold on, hold on. So, so you mean to tell me uh-huh. and, and none, and none of these situations, you are the drama or the problem. I think when you're not aligned with a person, both of you are the drama and the problem. That's, I, 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 I hate that that's a good answer i honestly i really <laughs> i mean it's the truth though i feel yeah. it's it's not a them thing or a me thing uh-huh. it's we don't we don't mix or match mix and match and so i i i say that there's been a couple of my relationships where it was very much like oh i would i will follow you i, mm. I whatever you say goes like i am all up in my feminine and i absolutely mm. love that but in my past i have chosen men based off of my timeline Mm. based off of my dad not doing well or being sick. And mm-hmm. so maybe I'll choose someone because it'd be easier to get married to them or, uh. you know, all of these. And this is just me sharing no, that's completely real transparently, yeah, I right? Like, that. like it's, it's the truth. But if I take the time to really vet you first and you take the time to really vet me first, because do we like each other or do we like the prototype? Okay. So let me ask this directly. Mm-hmm. And th- this may be something that, that goes viral because people all want to know, right? <laughs> Um, I'm asking you a couple of questions okay. and you tell me yes or no if it matters. Okay. All right, in a relationship or if you're dating them. Yeah. First thing we're gonna ask. Mm-hmm. I already know for, this question. For, for you to date a man, does does income matter? Yes. 
why would I choose a broke man if I don't have to, first of all? And I'm so sick and tired of this toxic society saying, oh, you date men for money. You date men for money. No, you date men with money. Because if I can't, if I've built what I've built, right, and you are okay with whatever X amount of dollars that is m- how does my, like, if I want to follow your lead, that means your vision has to be bigger than mine. Okay. okay so hold on. So does he have to make more money than you? I would prefer that. <laughs> that is my preference. Yes. Okay. But now, I mean, I don't, I don't know your, your financial situation, mm-hmm. but you know, a lot of people can't just get their parents a chef. I don't care who they are. Right. Yeah. Or a lot of people can't just So, so I could say that that kind of knocks off, you know, a lot of good men. Right. My dating pool is small. I'm clear. <laughs> But he may have a great job, right? He may have a great job. He could uh-huh. be making six figures, got a good 401k, got a solid job. You know, he's, he, and that's still, if you're not making more than you, it's a no-go. Yeah, my pr- my preference, my preference is to follow my man's lead. My, okay. My preference is to come into his territory and to help him expand. Okay. That okay. Is my all right. Preference. So, ladies and gentlemen, you got to make more money. That's, that's the answer. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> um, height. Does height matter? so much for me okay no height doesn't necessarily matter five four no so it does matter oh yeah it does <laughs> <laughs> that's not cool i know a lot of good dudes right like that are five four listen listen i don't think i've ever met a five four man i'm only i'm only five nine i'm five ten on a great day but you're taller than me but no but here's what i'm saying no I, I have a lot of friends that are you know my generation we just didn't get the height thing i don't know what it was but i know a lot of good guys that, that are that are short but five four just too. too not sure. I would say mm. I would say five nine is okay. Like five nine is five seven. Ooh. Oh, that's cool. I don't know. I don't know. I, that's I don't know. Cold. I would love this. I don't know. Okay. All right. We can. We can. Maybe. We can, Maybe if they have uh, everything else. If they have everything else, I'm not uh, gonna discriminate based on height because that sounds silly to me. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Does weight matter? No. Actually, it, to an extent, yes. Come on, man. Don't, don't I say this. Specific now. Yeah. So, so like if he's. So, so weight does matter, right? Like a I physical, a man physical that was appearance. Three hundred and fifty. No, I remember pounds. him, right? Yes. Yeah. And now you said that he was a drummer. And I remember you said you're a drummer. I see the connection now, right? It makes uh-huh. things make sense. You're more attracted to. Okay. So, does weight matter? To an extent, yes. I think now, yes. I'm in the gym five days a week. You know what I mean? I'm drinking smoothies. I'm eating salads. Like, I don't eat a lot of stuff. So if, and I also feel like too. One of the reasons why it's easier for me to keep weight off is because there's no temptation in the house. So when me and my husband are living in the same household, they're not going to be all of the snacks and the stuff and the things and whatever. What do you have, kids? That's going to change. But, uh, you're right. probably right. That's gonna we'll probably have a chef, though, that yeah. cook healthy snacks. Listen, uh, sometimes it's grab and go. Okay, it's time to go. <laughs> grab yeah, the healthy Grab snack. and go. Um, <laughs> healthy. All right, we'll see. Uh, but uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Dan, I forgot my um uh, my next one, but it was uh I think it was in the terms of uh damn what was I say I asked you about money five, money tight right weight weight uh-huh. height uh what what was the next one I was gonna ask you educational oh, man. level no it wasn't educational level but because that's you know cause, you know that's kind of yeah I got the degrees that don't really matter right yeah. so um wow, what was the next one? now I'm totally 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 forgetting it wasn't hygiene. Cause I know that's already, oh. we don't have to talk about that. Okay. That's a given, right? <laughs> can we just, can we just say for the men out there, hygiene is one of the most important things that you could ever have for a woman. Okay. Like hands, your hand, you don't have, don't have dirty nails, brush your teeth. Oh my goodness. You know, people, not here brushing their teeth. No, Stop you it. know, people, some people just need to go get their teeth cleaned okay. because they'll have like the tartar and plaque buildup. All right. Who's not brushing their teeth? Like we're not doing that. I'm not, we're not even going to go there. Let's not even, we who's can not, go there. No, because There's they're not brushing their teeth. That's just, yeah, we already know that's out here. Yeah. I found it. I remembered it. Baby mamas. If they, if they have Ooh. kids prior to meeting you. Yeah. Is that cool with you? Um, yes, but now I think I have a, a time limit on uh, how uh, how old the kid is. I was I cheated that. on by someone that with his baby mama. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, yo, you could have slept with anybody after the club. You're going to sleep with the person I got to look at for the rest of my life. Right. Are you crazy? I understand. OK, so so there is there an amount of kids or baby mamas that's allowed? Like, what is the oh. if it's two kids with one baby mama or, one, you know, can't one kid, two baby mama. That'd be weird. But 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? What I, I'm getting at. I really think it depends on the man. You know, I feel like there, there. Jill Scott said it best. It's like if you can't, if you can't tell me what to do, then you can't tell me what to do. But if you can tell me what to do, then you can tell me what to do. That's how I feel. Like it okay. really is contingent on the man. Just because you had children doesn't say anything about your character. It just says that you are out here free in these streets, which if you were single at the time could actually make a lot of sense. Two more. Uh, one I got to <laughs> ask about is uh, is uh, style, style of clothing. It's, does he have to be a person? I mean, for you, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of men like, Maybe it's like sweats, man. It's like tracksuit sweats, guys. Uh -huh. And then there's like guys like my guy Marcus, who you're not gonna see him without a, you know, what I'm saying without a button up or you know some nice shoes. And he type dude that wear no socks and it's to be clean, you know. So, <laughs> you know, some dudes can pull off the no. I can't pull off the no sock thing. That's just not my style. But uh -huh. st style is that important? Um, if his style is terrible, does he let me dress him? Like, would he be open to, like, I don't know. I'm just, ideas? Probably. Most men don't care if yeah. they're trying to look good for that woman. But I'm asking if you were to meet him off top and he had, like, a particular style that, you know. No, okay. All right. That's cool. Okay. Last one. This is a big one, right? Hair. Uh, hairstyle. Is that if he bald, fade, Caesar, long hair, does that determine whether you would, uh, he fits your category or not? No. I've okay. never even thought about that. Okay. Okay, because yeah. the dude's putting fake hair on now. Wow! So Just is that bald. is that okay? If I, I wear like if if, <laughs> if the dude is that okay if a dude like gets a you know a fake thing and gets it cut? I no, mean, I'm, look, I'm here for all of the things. Like I do wigs, weaves, natural, unnatural. I do all of. Well, the all things. women do. So I'm asking, is it okay for? I feel like my like why would my man my man would do that? Like, the same reason why you, the same reason why no, you I have it. beautiful hair. No, I'm not saying that you don't, but I'm saying that he may have a beautiful bald head. But yeah, why not rock a beautiful bald head? The same reason why you don't rock your beautiful hair. Sometimes I do. Sometimes he does. I don't know. I'm that asking, might be weird. That's... It might be quite not used to it. <laughs> I'm just asking questions for the people out there. Um, I don't know. I got I got questions. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I've never experienced that before. It's, it's I, coming around, right? You know what though? I feel like it's that all everything that you just said comes with a certain type of man. I don't like men that want to be like. Mm -mm. Just no, it just no. All right, we we can, we can go and no. That's mm -mm. fine. It ain't no real reason. Not the hair. I'm saying. I'm saying like a man that wants to be so fine. Like I don't want the man on a scale of one to ten. If he's a twelve, I don't want him. Mm. I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want his time. I don't want his energy. I don't want his essence. No parts. A lot of men feel to feel the same way actually about women. Yeah, they feel like it's too much to deal with. But it's too much, and yeah. the entitlement is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a no for me. Um, I understand. Well, um, as we wrap this up here, I want to say I do appreciate your time. I do appreciate you being vulnerable and um, sharing your experience with myself and my audience because um, I find it a true gem when I'm able to get black women on here. I don't actually get that quite often, believe it or not. Um, and I don't know if it's maybe it's my pull that I, I pull from and there's an aspect of like, okay, I got to, if I'm going to have people here, I want them to have something to say, right? Yeah. Something to offer. And I'm not saying that black women don't, but a lot of the time, I guess I'm just drawn to more men because I'm a man. So I try to handpick women when I do, they don't come my way often. So I appreciate you. Last question I have is some life advice that you would have. And it don't have to be in a relationship. It don't have to be in business. It's just living because it's all we're actually doing anyway. Everybody is having a human experience. Yeah. That is all, right? Yeah. We're all controlling this robot from somewhere yes. where we don't know. Yes. What is some life advice you would give people who are going to see this? I would say, number one, to remember that we've all been duped from our childhood because our aunties, our uncles, our cousins, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers, our friends, our professors, our colleagues, our associates, everyone is saying, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, that's great, except what is connected to achievement, whereas who is connected to fulfillment? And so I think that we live in this, this culture and this society, this constant get to the bag, get to the bag, get to the bag. Stop telling people to get to the bag when they have not first gotten to themselves. And so I would say, do the work to get to yourself. Do the work to have the hard conversations with self. Do the work to get out of your own way so you can truly be 
do and have. Be first, then you get to do, then you get to have. When you be, do, and have whatever it is that you want to be, do, and have, life is way different. It feels good and it feels in purpose, on purpose. So I would just say, number one, if you've been duped, it's okay. <laughs> Welcome to life. Um, but number two, that that's not where you have to stay. You're not a tree. You can get up and move, right? Like Uncle Jerry <laughs> I always says. love that. You're not a tree, right? <laughs> You're not a tree. Get up and move. So um, it and remember that it it takes time. Like how, how do you get good at anything by doing it? Right. How did you learn to read? You were terrible at first. How did you learn to walk? You couldn't at first. How did you learn to do anything? You were not there at first. You have to develop the skill set. And one of the most important skill sets we can have is like self-love, self-respect, self-appreciation, self-discipline, like you've got to do for self first so you can overflow into others around you instead of trying to pour from empty. Yeah. Most people don't love themselves unconditionally, which is, which is very tough. Right. And um, as uncle Jimmy would say, you know, success is not found in what you do. It's found in who you become. Yeah. And I think that you just reiterated that. So uh, once again, I want to thank you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your presence. Stop by before you went back home to the ATL. Yeah. And I think it's been since the last time we did this, it may have been five years. Yeah. Five years. Wow. Incredible Crazy. time. Um, where can people find you specifically? Oh, okay. Uh, you can find me at Ms. Sarah Fontenot. So M-S-S-A-R-A-H F-O-N-T-E-N-O-T on all platforms. Um, if you're excited about hearing about the event that I was talking about, it, it's happening in September. It's called Get Your Shift Together dot info. <laughs> <I see>. uh-huh. <laughs> dot info. Uh, see what you did there. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Time to get that shift together. Um Lil Wayne Dyer on you. you little little something. Some. Little so, so. yeah. Um Yeah, so pretty much uh those are the things that I have available for people. Um Instagram, YouTube, um, and all of the things. So that's pretty much it. Everything is on my drop down in Instagram. Well, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. If you didn't know, now you do know. And if you haven't been introduced, and if you have, well, I would like to reintroduce you to Miss Sarah Fontenot. Thank you so much.